Based on the true events of the Vallecas case, Shadows of Vallecas, in the heart of Vallecas, a bustling district of Madrid, Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro, a bright-eyed teenage girl, walked the familiar halls of her school with a mix of curiosity and trepidation. It was a day like any other, yet it was destined to be marked in her life as the beginning of an unimaginable journey. Whispers of a seance had been circulating among her classmates. A daring venture into the unknown, the idea was thrilling to Estefania, who had always been intrigued by the mysteries that lay beyond the veil of the living world, with her friends by her side. She gathered in an empty classroom. It was during a break, the air thick with anticipation and the unspoken fear of what might be. The makeshift Ouija board, crafted from scraps of paper and a crude planquette, lay in the center of their circle. The girls, hands trembling with a blend of excitement and fear, placed their fingers lightly on the planquette. Estefania, taking a deep breath, called out to the spirits, her voice a mix of confidence and uncertainty. Is there anyone there who wishes to speak to us? She asked, her voice echoing slightly in the quiet room. For a moment, there was nothing but the sound of their collective breathing. Then, slowly, the planquette began to move, sliding across the letters with a will of its own. The girls gasped, their eyes wide. As it spelled out a name they did not recognize, the air in the room grew colder. The light seemed to dim, and the sense of unease began to settle over them. Suddenly, the door to the classroom burst open. Startling the girls, the school janitor stood there, his face a mask of anger and concern. He scolded them for meddling with forces. No! They did not understand and quickly put an end to their seance, but the damage had been done. As Estefania left the room, she felt a chill run down her spine. A sense of dread that she couldn't shake off. She tried to laugh it off with her friends. To dismiss it as a silly game gone awry. Yet, deep down, she knew something had changed. A door had been opened, a boundary crossed. And she could not help but feel that something had followed her back from the shadows. That night, as Estefania lay in her bed, the events of the day replayed in her mind. The laughter and excitement of the seance had faded, leaving only the lingering fear of what they might have awakened. As she drifted off to sleep, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was no longer alone in her room, that unseen eyes were watching her from the darkness. In the days following the seance, Estefania's life began to unravel in ways she could never have imagined. It started subtly, with fleeting shadows at the corner of her eye and an inexplicable coldness that seemed to follow her wherever she went. These odd occurrences were easy to dismiss at first, attributed to an overactive imagination fueled by the recent foray into the occult. However, it wasn't long before these minor disturbances escalated into something far more sinister. Estefania started experiencing severe insomnia her nights played by an unshakable feeling of dread when she did manage to fall asleep. Her dreams were tormented by disturbing visions of faceless entities cloaked in darkness, whispering her name in a cacophony of disembodied voices. Her waking hours were no respite as she began to suffer from sudden, unexplained epileptic seizures. During these terrifying episodes, she would speak in tongues her body contorting in unnatural ways, her eyes rolling back to reveal only the whites. The episodes were sporadic and unpredictable, leaving her family and friends in a constant state of anxiety and fear, as if the physical symptoms were not enough. Estefania's mental state also began to deteriorate. She confided in her mother that she was being visited by strange human forms at night. These apparitions, devoid of faces and shrouded in cloaks, seemed to beckon her to join them in a realm beyond her understanding. Her descriptions were vivid and chilling, spoken with a conviction that left no doubt of their reality in her mind. The family, deeply concerned for Estefania's well-being, sought medical help, 
they took her to various hospitals, hoping to find an explanation for her sudden and alarming symptoms. Doctors conducted numerous tests, but each one returned inconclusive. No physical or neurological condition could account for the bizarre changes that had overcome her. This continued for weeks. Estefania's condition only worsened. She began to exhibit aggressive behavior, lashing out at those around her without warning or provocation. Her once vibrant personality was now overshadowed by a dark, unsettling presence that seemed to have taken hold of her. It was during one of these episodes that the unimaginable happened. Estefania, in a fit of uncontrolled rage, attacked her sister Marianella. The family watched in horror. As Estefania's actions became more violent, her strength seemingly superhuman, Marianella, caught off guard, fell to the floor, foam bubbling from her mouth. A victim of her sister's inexplicable fury, the following day, Estefania's health took a final, devastating turn. She experienced a severe attack of catalepsy, her body becoming rigid and unresponsive, in a state of panic. Her family rushed her to the hospital, where she fell into a deep coma. That night, under the sterile lights of the hospital room, surrounded by machines and hushed voices, Estefania Gutierrez Lazaro passed away. The cause of her death was a mystery. The autopsy report citing only sudden and suspicious death. The doctors were baffled, unable to provide the family with any answers. In the wake of her death, the Gutierrez family was left to grapple with their loss. Their grief compounded by the unexplained and terrifying events that had led to it. The Gutierrez home, once a haven of warmth and laughter, had transformed into a realm of unceasing sorrow and fear. Estefania's passing left a void filled by an eerie, oppressive atmosphere that clung to the walls like a thick fog. Her family, engulfed in grief, soon found themselves facing horrors that defied explanation. Whispers of Estefania's presence began to permeate the house. Her mother, Consuela, reported hearing her daughter's voice calling out to her. The familiar sound now twisted into a haunting echo that chilled her to the bone. These ghostly calls were often accompanied by the laughter of an old man, a sound that had no source and no reason to exist within their home. The disturbances grew in intensity and frequency. Objects moved of their own accord, as if manipulated by unseen hands, glasses shattered without cause, and doors slammed shut with violent force startling the family at all hours. One night, Consuela woke to the sensation of fingers brushing against her hands and feet, an invisible assailant leaving her paralyzed with fear. The younger daughters, Lucia and Irene, were not spared from the torment. They recounted waking up in terror, feeling their wrists being slammed against the wall by an invisible force. Their screams in the night became a regular occurrence each episode leaving the family more frayed and desperate. Weeks passed. The Gutierrez home became a hotbed of unexplainable phenomena. One November night, a photograph of Estefania hanging in the living room inexplicably caught fire. The flames consumed only her face, leaving the frame and surrounding objects untouched. This incident was the final straw, pushing the family to seek outside help desperate and with nowhere else to turn. Consuela contacted the police, a decision that marked a turning point in their ordeal. On November 27, 1992, Inspector Jose Negri and his team arrived at the Gutierrez residence. The family, to terrify it to remain inside, awaited the officers outside, huddled together in the rain. The police entered the home with skepticism but were soon confronted with the inexplicable. A locked wardrobe door burst open violently, nearly striking the officers. Unearthly noises emanated from the empty balcony, and a strange brown slime materialized on a bedside table without explanation. Most chillingly, a crucifix that had been hanging on the wall was found on the ground. Its wooden backing had been torn away. 
and three distinct claw marks scarred the wall where it once hung. The bathroom, identified by the family as the epicenter of the haunting, emanated an unnatural chill that left the season officer shaken. The police report, penned by Inspector Negri, detailed these events with a candor that betrayed his own disbelief. It was a testament to the reality of the terror that gripped the Gutierrez family. A rare acknowledgement of the paranormal by law enforcement, realizing the gravity of the situation and their inability to provide any rational explanation or assistance.